M S W Media. We'd like to thank our new sponsor, Microdose, for supporting the Daily Beans. Offer to learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code Daily Beans to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Friday, December 22nd, 2023. Today, right after Judge Beryl Howell ordered the immediate enforcement of the $148 million verdict against Rudy Giuliani, Rudy filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the Southern District of New York. Jack Smith has filed a response in the Trump immunity battle in SCOTUS. The Colorado Supreme Court justices face a flood of threats after ruling to remove Trump from the state primary ballot. A new lawsuit says Georgia's lieutenant governor should be disqualified for acting as a Trump elector. 16 states beyond Colorado have open legal challenges to Trump's eligibility for the ballot. And the NRA has hit rock bottom. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hello, my friend. Uh, Happy you. Happy Friday. And go ahead and tell everybody. (laughs) <laughs> well, I know some people out there, some Steph heads and bless Stephanie Miller. She told everyone I had a toothache on the, on the air this morning and um, it actually had a emergency root canal. Uh, apparently there was a bad infection as well. So uh, if you hear anything in addition to my normal mispronunciations of words or slurring or anything like that, it's because the numbness is wearing off. But I just want to say that I'm super grateful for generous dentists out there. Um, there's a lot of good ones and, uh, one of them was able to get me in on an emergency and I'm not in California. So that was, uh, very lucky. And then he referred me to someone who could do the root canal an hour later. So that was this morning and now I'm here. Um, but yeah, numbness is still a little bit, there's, there's a pain, but I was not about to miss my last show with you for 2023. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm so glad that you were able to get the care that you needed. And I'm so sorry that you're going through that because tooth pain is really the worst. Um, and and so, you know, I'm glad that you Thanks, AG. You got it taken care yeah, of. I've had I've had four root canals in my life. I don't mean to brag. Uh, <laughs> this was the most painful thing I've ever experienced, getting an infection mm. in a tooth. I'm sure there's people out there who've experienced this. I've just, I'd never have. And with your teeth, it's when you get an infection, there's nowhere for it to go. Like, it's not like this, the area can swell or, you know, it can, if, if it goes anywhere, it's because it's broken into the bone and gone into your bloodstream. No one wants that. So... Anyway, no one wants to hear this. How's everyone doing? Do we still have any listeners out there? Great. Let's get to the episode. (laughs) Yeah. And I, you know, I want to say my, my ears are a little hot. My head's a little hot right now. I'm very angry because I just watched a segment on, it was the beat with Ari Melber, but Katie Fang was in the chair who I adore. And she had a teacher on from Florida, Miss Wood, Miss Katie Wood. Uh, who is suing the state of Florida over the pronouns that aren't allowed to be used in school. And she's a math teacher. She's been, she's, she's gone by Miss Wood forever, you know, and now she's not allowed to say that she walks around. She can't use Miss. She's been referring to herself as teacher Wood because of this law. And she walks around every day, just like scared that she's going to get fired from her job teaching math. All she wants to do is teach math. And her students don't know what to do. They're, you know, students that she has a really close relationship with. They're like, oh, hey, Miss Wood. Oops, I can't, you know, I can't call you that. And it's just, I'm so angry. (laughs) It's insanity. It's absolutely insanity. I hope this, I I mean, I have the SOB. Whatever he does with his political career, I really hope that he loses the next election. I want DeSantis gone out of Florida. And I know that... Uh, the cancer has seeped into a lot of other legislatures in the state, legislators in the state, but he is definitely the head of that dragon. There's a lot of people that don't agree with that guy. 600 books on the book ban list. Um, yeah. Librarians are starting to sue. This This teacher is suing with a group of, of other teachers. It's just like, she just wants to fucking teach math, you know, and be who she is. And now this, this whole, this whole cloud over the thing that she loves. It's just so fucking infuriating. 
Uh, anyway, um, if you don't watch uh, Katie Fang on MSNBC, she's got the best guests. She's so incredible. She she really gets to the heart of the matter. So I, you know, I love watching her shows. Um, so it's the holiday week next week. I have some great new content for y'all. Um, including interviews with Neera Tandon, who was amazing to talk to, Amy McGrath, Phil Williams, Nashville's nosiest bitch, according to <laughs> Sean Oliver, Victor She, voice of a generation, Victor's amazing, Glenn Kirshner. I have the hosts of the of the podcast called Obscured, um, the amazing uh, podcast. Pete Struck, Olivia Troy, Anna Bauer, um, Tamar Hellerman. Uh, and later in this show, I'm going to be talking with John Fugelsang. So you get your Fugelsang Fridays. We're going to talk about what the Pope did with blessing same-sex unions, uh, among other things. And there will be a new episode of Jack on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, plus all new episodes of Clean Up on All 45 during the next couple of weeks. And uh, I will do my best to get to the bonus episodes. We do have a bonus of Clean Up on All 45. It's already in the can. You're going to get that if you're a patron of Clean Up on All 45. I'm going to do my best to do the beans bonus. I fly on Saturday, so I'm going to do my level best to get that to the patrons. Um, but please forgive me if it's, if it doesn't come out, but, uh, I've spent the last week just getting all these awesome interviews lined up for you. I really hope you enjoy them during the holiday week. All right. We have some quick hits before we hit the hot notes. So let's do that. And to make a long story short. Too late. All right. First up, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss won their bid yesterday on Wednesday to immediately enforce the $146 million judgment against Rudy. We talked a little bit about that. Judge Beryl Howell, uh, an Obama appointee, lifted an automatic stay of 30 days that she'd imposed on the verdict that allows Freeman and Moss to try to seek money. Giuliani owes them immediately. But then Rudy filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the Southern District of New York. And even though this judgment is bankruptcy proof because it comes from a tortious uh, claim of defamation where actual malice was involved, and even though this bankrupt bankruptcy judge is going to be like, whatever, bro. Uh, this still does put an automatic stay on that judgment. So we will keep an eye on this story for you. All right. Thank you so much. And Jack Smith has filed a response to Trump's opposition to have the Supreme Court hear his immunity case before the D.C. Circuit Court rules on the matter after their oral arguments scheduled for January 9th. And uh, A.G., I know you and Andy are going to discuss that, the latest on this weekend's episode of Jack. Absolutely. All right. We have a lot of news to get to today. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. First up from Ryan Riley at NBC. I still am laughing about the Bumble Honey Pot story. Oh, it's so good. Uh, but this is uh, not as funny. In the 24 hours since the Colorado Supreme Court kicked former President Donald Trump off the state's Republican primary ballot, social media outlets have been flooded with threats against the justices who ruled in the case. That's according to a report obtained by NBC. Advanced Democracy, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that conducts public interest research, identified significant violent rhetoric against the justices and Democrats, often in direct response to Trump's post about the ruling on his platform, Truth Social. They found that some social media users posted justices' email addresses, phone numbers, and office building addresses. Quote, this ends when we kill these fuckers. That's what a user said on a pro-Trump forum that was used by several January 6th rioters. Quote, what do you call seven justices from the Colorado Supreme Court at the bottom of the ocean? Asked another user. A good start was the answer. Posts, uh, whose images and links were included in the report, noted a variety of methods that could be used to kill those perceived as Trump's enemies. Hollow point bullets, rifles, ropes, bombs. Quote, kill judges, behead judges, roundhouse kick a judge in the, to the concrete. That was one post from a fringe website. Slam dunk a judge's baby into the trash can. The threats fit into a predictable and familiar pattern seen time and time again after legal developments against Donald Trump. After the FBI searched Trump's Mar-a-Lago home in Florida, a man who had been at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th attacked the FBI field office in Cincinnati with a nail gun while holding an AR-15 style rifle. When a grand jury in Georgia indicted Trump, some of his supporters posted the grand juror's addresses online. And when U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin was assigned to special counsel Jack Smith's federal election interference case against Donald, she faced threats from Trump supporters as well. A federal appeals court pointed out the pattern when it upheld a narrowed gag order against Donald Trump in his election interference case this month, noting that those he publicly targets are often threatened and harassed. Daniel J. Jones, the president of Advanced Democracy, 
the group that compiled this, this report about threats, said the consistency of the violent threats and rhetoric was especially concerning. We are seeing significant violent language and threats being made against the Colorado justices and others perceived to be behind yesterday's Colorado Supreme Court ruling. That's a former FBI investigator, Jones is, and a staffer for the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he spoke to NBC News in a statement. The normalization of this type of violent rhetoric and lack of remedial action by social media entities is cause for significant concern. Trump's statements, which have sought to delegitimize and politicize the actions of the courts, is serving as a key driver of the violent rhetoric. Political leaders on both sides of the political aisle need to speak out against these calls for violence, and social media platforms need to reassess their role in hosting and promoting this rhetoric. A spokesperson for the Colorado Supreme Court did not immediately respond for comment, uh, and a Trump campaign official also did not respond, and we're probably better off for that. Yeah, I think so. I, people have to remember this. Republicans are the ones that actually brought this to the Colorado courts. Republicans. It was his own party. Mm -hmm. And no one's paying attention to that on MAGA. MAGA, MAGA, potato, potato. <laughs> All right, AG, this one's from the Associated Press. Uh, a Georgia judge heard arguments but didn't rule Monday on a long shot attempt to disqualify Georgia Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones from holding office because of Jones's participation as an elector for Donald Trump in 2020. Now, the lawsuit comes as a decision remains in limbo on whether to prosecute the Republican on state charges due to a lack of special prosecutor willing to take the case. Mm -hmm. A group of four Georgia voters, including the former head of the Atlanta branch of the NAACP on December 7th, asked a judge to declare that Jones ineligible to hold office in Georgia. Now, they allege he violated his oath of office by signing his name as a Trump elector. Democrat Joe Biden, as we know, was certified as winning Georgia's 16 electoral votes in 2020's election. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stacey Abrams. Yeah. Now, opponents nationwide are challenging Trump's eligibility to appear on ballots, arguing he's barred under a clause in the U.S. Constitution that forbids those who, and I quote, engaged in insurrection from holding office. Well, the provision was mainly used after the Civil War to keep former Confederates out of government. Seems like that's how, how it's being used now. In Georgia, challengers argue the same clause bars Jones from holding office. That's because Jones, then a state senator, had taken a note to support the U.S. and Georgia constitutions. They say Jones, in a quote, is an insurrectionist against the Constitution of the United States of America. Well, Jones, who didn't attend Monday's hearing, said the challenge is fueled by partisan politics. Quote, like Donald Trump, I am being targeted by liberal Democrats intent on weaponizing the legal system against strong conservatives fighting for common sense conservative values. Mm. Again, that was brought by Republicans in Colorado. William Dillon, Jones's attorney, argues that the challenge lacks evidence to show Jones engaged in an insurrection against the United States or has given aid and comfort to the enemies of the United States. Well, Superior Court Judge Thomas Wilson heard arguments Monday in Jones's hometown of Jackson, Georgia. That's about 40 miles south of Atlanta. Wilson gave lawyers time to file additional briefs before ruling. Wayne Kendall, who's a lawyer for the petitioners, said in a telephone interview after the hearing that he expects Wilson to reject the challenge. Kendall said he then expects to appeal to state Supreme Court. Jones was one of 16 Republicans who gathered on December 14th of 2020 at Georgia's gold-domed Capitol, claiming to be legitimate electors. Well, the meeting is critical to the prosecution of Trump and 18 others who were indicted by a Georgia grand jury in August for efforts to overturn Biden's narrow win. Now, the state prosecuting attorney's counsel, that's supposed to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate whether Jones's actions were criminal. Now, Pete Scandalakis, the council's executive director, said by text message Monday that he has yet to find a prosecutor. Scandalakis said he anticipated he would eventually find one, though. Hmm. Yeah. And remember, Fonnie Willis couldn't investigate Burt Jones. She had to recuse because she did a fundraiser for his opponent. Right. Right. That's the thing. All right. From the Times, this week's decision by the Colorado Supreme Court to disqualify Trump from holding office again was the first victory for a sprawling legal effort that is still unfolding across the country. At least 16 other states currently have pending legal challenges to Trump's eligibility for office under the 14th Amendment. And that's according to a database maintained by Lawfare, a nonpartisan site dedicated to national security issues. The lawsuits argue he's barred because he engaged in an insurrection with his actions surrounding January 6th. 
Four of these lawsuits, Michigan, Oregon, New Jersey, and Wisconsin, have been filed in state courts. Eleven lawsuits, Alaska, Arizona, Nevada, New York, New Mexico, South Carolina, Texas, Vermont, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming have been filed in federal district courts. Cases in two of these states, Arizona and Michigan, were initially dismissed by a lower court but have been appealed. Another challenge has also been made in Maine. The Trump campaign has said it will appeal the ruling in Colorado, in which the state Supreme Court said it would put its decision on hold. It won't go in effect until January 4th in hopes of receiving guidance from the Supreme Court. And if they don't get guidance, Trump goes on the primary ballot. Quote, we are also cognizant that we travel in uncharted territory and that this case presents several issues of first impression. That's what the justices wrote, noting that their decision could change based on, quote, the receipt of any order of mandate from the Supreme Court. Now, if SCOTUS agrees to hear the appeal, the Colorado Supreme Court's hold will be temporarily lifted and Trump will be eligible to be placed on the state's Republican primary ballot until the nation's top court reaches a decision. As I just kind of explained there, such an appeal would also likely freeze the other lawsuits. If the Supreme Court takes the case, it will effectively stay the proceedings in all other states. That's Judge Michael Ludig, a retired appeals court judge who's also a very conservative judge. He testified before the January 6th committee, and he's also a leading supporter of bringing the 14th Amendment challenge. Nine of the active federal cases were, in fact, brought by John Anthony Castro, a long-shot Republican presidential candidate who filed challenges in 27 states regarding Trump's eligibility under the 14th Amendment, as well as a case with the Supreme Court. In October, the Supreme Court said it would not take up Mr. Castro's challenge, and federal judges in Florida, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire have also dismissed his lawsuits. He voluntarily withdrew suits in 12 other states. Now in Maine, the Secretary of State is expected to rule in the coming days on a challenge to Mr. Trump's ballot eligibility. The process in Maine is slightly different. A provision in state law allows residents to challenge ballot eligibility, and the Secretary of State hears the challenge first. Then either party can appeal that decision to the state's superior court. Meanwhile, the nation's attention will focus on whether the Supreme Court takes up the Colorado case. If it declines, Trump will be ineligible to appear on the Colorado ballot. That's according to the Colorado Department of State. So if they say nothing, he's on the ballot January 4th because they have to do the ballot January 5th. If they decline to take the case, he's not on the ballot. That is them saying, we let your ruling stand. Now, the Supreme Court will face some pressure from the political calendar. As Jenna Griswold, the Colorado Secretary of State, indicated on MSNBC Tuesday night, again, January 5th is that deadline for her. A host of other states also hold their primaries on March 5th, known as Super Tuesday, including several with pending lawsuits, Virginia, Texas, and Vermont. Alaska also holds its caucuses that day. The federal deadline for election officials to send absentee ballots to military and overseas voters is 45 days before the day of the election. For South Carolina, an early nominating state, with pending lawsuits uh, on this, that would be January 10th, according to the South Carolina Secretary of State's office. So that's kind of the roundup of what's going on in the rest of the states. All right. Thank you so much, A.G. And I'm going to close this section out with some good news. Yep. This is from Sollenberger at the Daily Beast. Few political groups in the U.S. history have seen a collapse as swift and dramatic as the National Rifle Association. Now, over the last several years, the NRA has experienced a public implosion. As the group loses members and revenue amid serious accusations of mismanagement and corruption. Now, and according to the latest NRA tax returns obtained by the Daily Beast, the reputational and organizational damage is rolling on with seemingly no end in sight. Oh, bummer. I know. So sad. Wah, wah. What is clear is that the NRA today is in dismal state, which I love hearing. On the income side of things, 2022 was the fourth year in a row that revenue fell, marking its weakest fundraising year since at least 2008. Hmm. Membership dues are at an all-time low right now, according to available public data, and staffing is at the lowest point since these costs began their downward plunge in 2016, while the group's legal costs, largely driven by civil actions alleging rampant mismanagement of funds and self-dealing, well, those are proportionally higher than they've ever been. Mm. The roughly $211 million that the NRA reported in income last year, and by the way, that is still an enormous figure. It's more than double that of its handful of gun rights competitors combined, but it's also less than 60% of the NRA's 2016 revenue high, which was $367 million. 
Well, that decline has driven the NRA deep into the red, leading to a $22 million deficit last year. Hmm. That's the group's largest deficit since 2016, when it spent record sums during a vital election cycle, leaning on its high revenues and fat cash reserves as ballast for the spending binge. Today, however, the well is drying up. Hmm. NRA's net assets, they have plummeted. An internal audit obtained by watchdog group Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington shows that the group shed $36 million in value during 2022, going from $77.8 million in January to $41.8 million by year's end. Mm. Now, one major contributor to the drop in dues, with member fees bringing in around $83 million in 2022, the lowest on record, by the way, since at least 2008, a nearly 59% drop from 2016, adjusted for inflation, and that's according to an analysis this October from Crew. Now, the NRA also saw its lowest income from contributions and grants income since 2011, despite an overall 35% increase in fundraising expenses, indicating that the group's investments are yielding smaller returns, a lot like their penises. You can uh, read more about that, by the way, on The Daily Beast. So just search for, and I quote, the NRA is at rock bottom. Oh, do you like all my, oh, mm. I did. I loved mm. all those. I hope they're not edited out. I want all the moaning and oh. Uh, mm. So major drop in dues, major drop in contributions and grants. So bummer. Yep. Memberships falling off a cliff. Huh. Wonder why. Oh, well. I ain't sad. Are you sad? I'm not sad. No, I'm just sad. Yeah, I cry a tear. Thoughts and prayers, NRA. Thoughts and prayers. Yep, yep. That's exactly the good, re- that's the remedy right there. For real. All right. Um, That was good news, but we have listeners submitted good news that we need to get to, but we're going to take a quick break. And then before that, you're going to get John Fugel saying in your ears, um, which I think that you will enjoy. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, if you're curious about microdosing THC, you are not alone. Many folks are turning to this practice to boost their well-being and cognitive performance. It's about finding the sweet spot, the vibe, the zone, right? Similar to a post-workout bliss, kind of like that, you know, uh, that, um, what are those called? Endorphins, right? Or, you know, just a nice uh, serotonin boost. It's it's awesome. It can, It's chill. But you're focused. I absolutely love it, and it does. You don't overdo it, so you don't get the side effects. Microdose sent me some gummies so I could learn more about getting in the zone, and you can try it too. Go to microdose.com and use code Daily Beans to get free shipping and thirty percent off your first order. I started using microdose gummies to manage my daily anxiety and tension, and to help me get some sleep. They have drastically uplifted my mood, brought a sense of relaxation and calm. Plus. My sleep has never been better, and I'm able to be more mindful. It's really awesome. They're also a blessing for recovery after workouts, enhancing my focus, sparking my creativity in unexpected ways. I really appreciate microdosing and everything that it does for me. I think you will too. To learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code DAILYBEANS to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Again, that's microdose.com, code DAILYBEANS. microdose.com, code DAILYBEANS for 30% off. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's Friday. That means it's Fugle Sang Fridays. So joining me now from the Tell Me Everything show on Sirius XM Progress Channel 127, weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and host of the John Fugle Sang show podcast. So you don't have to subscribe to Sirius, but, you know, it's always a good thing to do because you get you get first wave, which is like the coolest station. That's right. On Sirius. We are the only 24 <laughs> 7 progressive talk station on the world's largest streaming audio company. So, yes. 100%. I, 100%. Yes. It's a great, great channel, uh, <laughs> XM Progress 127. And then First Wave, Channel 33. Why, that's right. Uh, John Fugel saying hello. And with the free preview weekend, you can sample all the great programming at Sirius XM. <laughs> Thank you. Allison, it's so good to see you. Oh, Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas to you. We're, we're in a week where the Pope blessed gay unions. Rudy Giuliani was found guilty and declared bankruptcy. Trump was thrown off a ballot. Um, and Confederate memorials torn down in Arlington Cemetery. This has been like porn for the angels this mm. week. And the Lord brought lube. It's been, whoa, Christmas came early. Yeah, it absolutely did. We've covered that uh, Arlington Cemetery thing. I was just there and I was like, come on, guys. Uh, And uh, they had to the end of the year to do it and they're doing it. So that's wonderful. We'll get to that. But I want to talk about this Pope thing, because at first I was like, sweet, Pope blesses marriages. Then I read a little bit more and I was like, no, okay. 
he he you can bless uh, but not the marriage. Marriage is still between a man and a woman in the Catholic Church, and the blessing has to be non-liturgical. Yes. But uh, baby steps. Uh, this is a good piece of forward progress. Uh, I, I, I wonder why, though, everyone's kind of cool with baby steps with the Vatican, but not with the government. But anyway, we could talk about that in a whole <laughs> sure. other show. Sure. But, but what are your what are your thoughts on this? Because I, I wish it would have gone further. But I mean, it's better than nothing. I mean, it's better than anything I ever would have hoped for with any pope in my lifetime. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, baby steps in the Vatican is is like saying gigantic wormhole epoch spanning leaps. Uh, this would have been unthinkable when we were kids. I mean, it would have been unthinkable that you'd have marriage equality in this country. But I have to tell you, um, I love when Pope Francis enrages all the fake Christians by acting like Jesus. Uh, there is no Jesus-based justification for homophobia. This should be really, really simple. There's like six or seven lines our friends, those hopeless romantic homophobes, use from the Bible to justify their anti-gay hangups and bigotry. None of them come from Jesus. None of them are technically able to use to condemn gay relationships. You know, a lot of them, St. Paul was using translations in Greek for Roman temple prostitutes, and the word homosexual was added in Romans and Timothy in 1946. <laughs> Nobody follows Leviticus. Sodom and Gomorrah is about attempted gang rape of angels. Uh, I tell my homophobe friends, if you think attempted gang rape is the same as consensual relations, you are sleeping with the wrong men, Reverend. <laughs> so I think you, there is no Christian case for homophobia. What the Pope did enraged these Pharisees because he spoke like Jesus. And not to get too wishy-washy Christmassy about it, but that's the story of Christmas. It's not about a little baby being born so lambs will, you know, groove to a drum. And who plays a drum for a baby, by the way? What the fuck is wrong with the little drummer boy? <laughs> the Romans are searching for us. We have sand in all of our food. The baby's trying to sleep, and you're playing a drum. Kid, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> but I get such. You're waking up my kid. He's not your kid, Joseph. Shut up, Mary. But I, I get sidetracked. The, the whole point is it's the birth of a radical revolutionary, right? Whether you believe in the Bible as literal fact or metaphor or he's the original innocent brown skin guy executed by the state. Ra the character in the book is a radical revolutionary who freaks out conservative power structures, both governmental and religious, and they conspire to kill him because he's such a threat. And his love is so powerful that he comes back. It's an amazing story, whether you take it literally or as metaphor or what, whatever you believe. So for the Pope to come out and say, yeah, you don't get to judge J gay people, and God made them, and their love is as valid as yours. Now. He split the difference. He's like John Roberts. He's going to throw something from red meat to both sides. You can bless gay unions, but you, it can't be a marriage. That's still just for the straight. You know, and again, I mean, this is the Vatican that still believes that 51% of the world population is unfit to say mass. And there's nothing in the Bible justifying that either. There's still no knob, no job. Like, they can't even be brought to the 20th century on women. So the very fact they've come this far it means a lot, and it means that there are parents who won't throw out their children somewhere in the world because of this. It means there are young people who have been raised in this faith and won't commit suicide because they have just been granted validation by the spiritual leader of the church their parents baptized them into. There's so much good that comes from this, but the best good from it, Allison, is how much it's really freaking out the fake Christians at Christmas time. I love it. Mm, speaking of uh, the very angry fake Christians at Christmas time, uh, Donald Trump's been thrown off the ballot in Colorado, and yeah, it's it, it's like they kicked the beehive. Civil war, calls for civil war are happening, <laughs> which is funny <laughs> because that was the sure. cause of the Fourteenth Amendment in the first place. Ding, ding, ding! The irony is thick. Uh, you oh, can I, slice I, it with a knife. I have a uh, different <laughs> word than irony, Allison. But I'll go with that. Okay. <laughs> and you know, the thing is, is that this. This decision is stayed. If the Supreme Court doesn't intervene, Trump will be on the primary ballot. That is what this particular Colorado Supreme Court said. But I think the big story here that everyone's kind of missing is it was a 4-3 decision, but the three who dissented didn't dissent on anything that the Supreme Court needs to, dis to discuss because it was all local Colorado election law. All seven unanimously agreed 
that Donald Trump engaged in an insurrection. That is correct. And that's why the Republicans are really freaking out, because now there's legal precedent to take elected officials who helped the 2020 insurrection off ballots. This is why Jim Jordan and Matt Gates are going to have a bad Christmas. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lindsey Graham are going to have a bad Christmas. They These people need to be on defense. And if you're Democratic or liberal or progressive or leftist or anti-evil, you're probably tired of always seeing these guys on the offense. I want to see every one of these guys, Paul Gosar, Kevin McCarthy, they all share the same pre-existing sedition. So you nailed it, Allison. The most important piece of this is not about Colorado and Trump on the ballot. We'll get to that. It's about the fact that now there's precedent to nail other corrupt motherfuckers who engaged in this and were part of this phony elector scheme. As far as the actual vote, I, I see both ways of it. I, I think it's undeniable that, yeah, it he's dead to rights. They can take him off the ballot. He is unfit to be on the ballot. This is legally unquestionable. Politically, I'm a little scared of it. Uh, yeah. And I, I made a lot of people mad, but I'm a little scared. I think the Supreme Court will find a way to, to wiggle their way out of this, whether it's the text of the uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment saying uh, an oath to support where he takes an oath, the president takes an oath to defend, protect, you know, uphold, not support. Uh, yeah. Even though those things mean support, uh, it, but they may find some weird textual thing. They might say, hey, this is a primary. A primary is different from a general. And so this isn't ripe for this yet. Go back and try True. again. They might do that. They might. Uh, th there's a million. They ways. might come out and say that he hasn't been convicted in a federal court. They might say that. Mm -hmm. There were no. But Confederates who were banned from office were not convicted in a federal court either. The main point is you're exactly right. They're going to brush away. They're going to deny Trump's request to, to uh, have his immunity that presidents can't commit crimes. And they're going to be like the Pope. They're going to be Solomonic, something and for each side. Baby. So Trump, we say no to you on this, but Wisconsin, uh, Colorado Supreme Court, we say no to you as well. And the irony of all of this is, you know, Donald Trump's not going to win the Colorado election. No. <laughs> 10 electoral votes, you can already put them on the board for Joe Biden 11 months early. So he's not ever going to win those votes anyway, then everyone's freaking out about it. I totally support Donald Trump fundraising off of this and taking millions of dollars to try to overturn the Colorado Supreme Court and then lose all of Colorado's electoral votes anyway. That is redistribution of wealth we can believe in. Please, MAGA, give your money to Trump for this right away. It'll really make a difference and it'll help him lose Colorado fair and square. Yeah, well, their their bank accounts are quite a bit uh, more empty than usual because all of the funds are going to yeah, Donald that's Trump's Hunter, legal fees. That's Hunter Biden's fault. That's Hunter of Biden course, right. and the Ukrainians, Allison. You're right. I'm sorry, but uh, you know who else's uh, bank account is empty? Apparently, Rudy Giuliani. He has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which will not get him out of this judgment, though it does put it on a brief hold while the bankruptcy court decides what to do with it, mm. which mm. is not going to be good for him because. He was hiding his assets in this case, along with discovery. He thought that was worth whatever the judgment was going to be. But now when you file, you can't hide when you file Chapter 11 bankruptcy what your assets are. So everything will be laid bare. He That's says right. he has about one to ten million dollars in assets and is about five hundred million dollars in debt, including to the IRS. Yeah. Although no charges there. And he gave himself a loan which is what uh, the Republicans are on about Hunter Biden. So I'm sure Jim Jordan will take this up in his weaponization committee any any day now. And David Weiss, I'm sure, will uh, want to investigate this uh, and bring charges against Rudy for not paying. And, and the, the IRS has already put liens on him. I mean, and but now this $150 million lien on every penny that Rudy Giuliani earns for the rest of his stupid life. Thoughts and prayers. Go to the... He will be working for Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss for the rest of his time on earth. Yep. Let me say, I I want to see the reality show where Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss move into Giuliani's Manhattan mansion now. I want that on the air before the end of this year, okay? I want them to move. I want all of Rudy's furniture and booze and clothing and sex toys, all of it to still be there. And I want to see these ladies living in his mansion. This is a beautiful story. This is so great for everyone who has watched their TV in slack-jawed befuddlement and horror at these liars parading around. And really, it shows that the greatest thing about America 
is that it's never the leaders who save us. It's always the people who create movements and then the leaders catch up. This is such a great story about democracy because this, for me, has really been the year of, yes, people showing up to vote and take the country back at the ballot box, but it's also been the story of a civics lesson of Americans using the judicial branch to petition the government for redress of grievances. And we have seen people fight back against fascism in the courts since Trump's first year in office. But we're watching Alex Jones and a billion uh, dollars, is it, for the for the uh, Sandy Hook families? One point, yeah, almost a billion to 1.5 almost. Donald Trump had to pay $5 million to E. Jean Carroll. Now she wants 10 Rudy Giuliani with $148 million to these Georgia election workers. And more to Fox come. News. Fox News, three quarters of a billion dollars. And Tucker Carlson got fired. These are not from government. This is not from law enforcement. This is all from citizens suing the bad guys and actual courts showing that justice can work in ways beyond elected officials. I I, I, I hate to be so Pollyannish about my country, but it's really inspiring. And now I want to, I just want to hear Joe Biden tell the joke that Rudy Giuliani is noun, verb, and chapter 11. That's, that's going to make it perfect for me. <laughs> yeah. And we're about to get, uh, um, we've got to, I believe, closing arguments on January 11th, five days before the oh. E. Jean Carroll uh, trial starts for the New York Attorney General's $250 million disgorgement That's right. Suit, That's right. Where fraud has already been found. And a fifth direct judgment has been uh, denied by Judge Angoron for Donald Trump. That's right. It's not going to be pretty for him. I think he's going to uh, lose his business. He's going to lose his ability to do business in the state of New York. He's going to lose his business licensure. Uh, along with his adult children, but except for Ivanka, she was taken off of that lawsuit for whatever reason. I think uh, statute of limitations. That's correct. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I have long said, you know, people who are saying, F Merrick Garland, he's not doing his job. The only thing that will save us is if Donald Trump is indicted and if these people go to, you know, or if they are indicted and they go to prison. But stripping them of all of their wealth, I think, from citizens in, in civil suits is. It's great. Way worse for these folks, yes. I think, than, you know, what was That's it? how they got OJ. That's how they got OJ. Justice works in different ways if you keep at it. And I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's amazing that Donald Trump destroyed everything he inherited from both his father and Barack Obama. But he managed to do it. And I'm just glad we got to see it. Yeah, And don't get me wrong. I'm glad he's been indicted. And I think he will be convicted and go to jail. There's also the the civil case in January uh, against Trump and his kids for the pyramid scheme they did with the Celebrity Apprentice. That's finally coming to trial next month. Donald Trump has seven trials next month. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, and if the if the immunity interlocutory appeal pushes the March trial date back for the D.C. indictment from Jack Smith, Al, Alvin Bragg is ready to go for with the Stormy, Hush, Stormy Daniels Hush Money case in, in March. It's just it, the hits keep coming. Yeah. And again, can I also sell, to tell people, can we stop comparing Trump to Hitler just because he's a gun loving pro militarism nationalist who hates abortion, hates immigrants, hates labor unions, hates collective bargaining, hates gay rights and communists just like Hitler. And just because he demonized a powerless minority as vermin infestation poisoning the blood of the nation, just because of that, you're going to compare him to Hitler? It's wrong, people. <laughs> it's wrong. I was wondering where you were going with that. The, the other joke I heard was, don't compare it to Hitler. Hitler had a plan. <laughs> oh, Hitler had a plan. And somewhere in hell, Hitler is furious at Donald Trump for making him look bad. But, you know, He's he'll, tell him, he'll tell him when he sees him. <laughs> yeah, that's um, it's the as I've said, justice is every day sucks for him and, and tomorrow will suck worse for, for the rest. But that's of his it. Life. Right. I mean, Henry Kissinger is having a better December than Rudy Giuliani. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we just have to keep at it and, and hold faith. And this is not schadenfreude. I don't think people want to see Donald Trump and Giuliani suffer needlessly. I think people want to see justice. We all have to sit there and watch these privileged class liars and con men just parade themselves on TV. If any of us behaved the way they behaved, we'd be fired. If an intern in any corporation in America uh, told four non-white female employees to go back where they came from, that intern would be fired because we hold unpaid interns to a higher standard than Republican presidents. So I think we all are breathing a collective sigh of joy and, and just exhaustion that we're finally beginning to see justice rear its head. Now, if we could get that for the Supreme Court, because well, any other person who works for the federal government, if you want to spend $20 on a baby shower gift for Janine and HR, 
you have to, you know, get clearance. It has to be under $20. But here we have somebody who doesn't understand how to interpret financial disclosure forms interpreting the Constitution of the United States. I hope he recuses uh, from this immunity argument. I'm sure he will. I'm sure. (laughs) I'm sure Clarence Thomas, because of his wife, I'm sure he'll recuse. You know, when Nixon was in the same position, he was so cocky that he had the Supreme Court in his pocket, too, because of his appointees. And it was William Rehnquist. William Rehnquist mm-hmm. himself, who uh, who who took himself out of it um, and and abstained, and then you have to imagine that means that a segregationist was more ethical than Clarence Thomas. A segregationist had higher standards, but I don't know if it's ever going to happen. What I think could happen is if Mike Bloomberg still wants to be popular with Democrats, how about taking a few of those billion and just buy Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito? It's not hard to do. It's called bribe back better. And why can't we bribe Supreme Court justices if Harlan Crow can? Uh, very, I'm sure we can outbid Harlan Crow easily. Very well. But I, we, we talked about starting a GoFundMe to, to buy back uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, with bribes, uh, but we, you know, we we would need to rent a super yacht, um, yeah. do some sort of a fishing trip. I know he's already got an RV, so we we can't really <laughs> we can't really uh, you know tempt him with a new RV or anything. But he's a man of the people. Maybe get him a Walmart gift card for a few that, million. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I mean, look, Clarence, and and by the way, Harlan Crow, why why wouldn't a guy donate to both Cornell West and Clarence Thomas? It makes perfect sense. Come on, makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah, and Dean Phillips too. So like and everyone, Dean Phillips too. That's it. Uh, anyway, my friend, thank you. This is our, uh, I, th- I believe, our last uh, Fugal Sang Friday of the year. We're going to be off next week, but we have uh, tons of interviews for you and new content coming your way. But it has been uh, amazing having you with us on Fridays, my friend. If we if we work something out next week where we can squeeze you in, we'll we'll do it. But uh, I, I appreciate you coming on and and being with being with me on Fridays. It, it, you you make the Fridays brighter. Oh, well, thank you. Listen, I, I want to thank you for what you do. Uh, your listeners are amazing and you do such great programming. And it's really hard to take all this depressing stuff and leave people feeling entertained and inspired. You do it all the time. It's what I'm trying to do. I'm writing a new script about a politician in D.C. called uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and Waste Your Tax Dollars Just to Fuck with Hunter Biden. Uh, I'm hoping that'll be my inspirational political story for the new year. Lovely. Jason Smith. Is that his name? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, remember. I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, Ways and Means Committee guy. That's that's who, who that that's is. It. Um, who released his tax returns uh, against probably the law. Okay. Thank that's you right. again, everybody. Thank you please again. check out um, Tell Me Everything on Sirius XM Progress Channel 127, weeknights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific. And of course, the John Fugel Sang Show podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, is free to download. Thank you so much, my friend. Have a wonderful, wonderful holiday. You're the best, Miss Gill. Thank you. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have good news, confessions, corrections, what the mutt, what's the model of your oxalotl, opine on the bovine, what the heck wine, what the shell, cat me if you can. Did I miss anything? Find um, what the mutt, what the mutt, oh. find the cat, <laughs> the original, what the, the original, mutt. the OG is we've lost, we've lost track of the plot, people. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, sometimes that happens, especially on a Friday. Uh, if you have a self shout out, shout out to a small business. If you have pod pet tax to pay, if you don't have pod pet tax to pay, you can send us an adoptable pet in your area. Tell me your theses or dissertation titles, misheard song lyrics, shit kids say, frog orgies, baby pictures, anything, anything at all. Send it to us, dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. First up from Ken B from New York, Philadelphia, and soon to be St. Louis. Hi, Beans Queens. I'm one of those annoying folks who enjoys catching errors in TV shows and movies. (laughs) And after a couple years, I finally caught a bad bean. In Wednesday's show, AG mentioned Channel 6 Action News in New York. I grew up in Brooklyn and Queens and verified just before writing that the ABC affiliate in New York is still Channel 7. Who has eyewitness news? I've been living in Philadelphia for over 45 years where we have Channel 6 Actions News. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's in Philly. I moved to Philly in 1978 for love, but lost that love to cancer almost five years ago. A beautiful lady who lost her love found me in a dating app 
And in about a month, I'll be taking my blue vote from PA to a red state in the Midwest where she's fighting hard for freedom. Way back in 73, my mom, who was coming home from work on the New York City subway, rescued a mutt shepherd who was thrown into the subway car at the East Broadway station. She took her home and we named her E.B. for East Broadway. Nice. She was less than two years old. She had had one or two litters. Uh, she was in shock and showed signs of abuse. We, mom, dad, brother, and I took care of her and she lived a long, happy life in a home filled with love. The outdoors photos is my dad walking E.B. Look at E.B. Oh, so sweet. Oh, little baby. I, Those that's are great how, pictures. Every day, somebody abuses an animal in a way I've never even thought of before. Just throwing him in a subway car? Like, fuck them. Well, their loss. There's a special place in hell for people that hurt animals, I'll tell you that. Their loss is Ken B's gain. What a beautiful baby. Absolutely. All right, this is from Sean, pronouncing in him. Hello. I was supposed to say that in a Mrs. Doubtfire voice, so hopefully I did that well. I wanted to write in to give a shout out to my husband for rescuing another dog this year. He originally went to the Sacramento shelter to look for a new dog for his friend. Well, unfortunately, his friend couldn't handle a Belgian Malinois, so we moved on from him. Now, four days later, my husband got an email from the shelter saying that the dog bit someone and they would have to put him down unless we drove down and got him that day. The guilt trip worked. And now we have a herd of three shepherds. <laughs> you can only imagine the amount of hair I vacuum up every day. The Malinois came to us not having been brushed for what looked like a year and weighing only 73 pounds. Fast forward a few months and he's now a happy and healthy 105 pound freight train pushing anything and everything out of his way. <laughs> yep. I also want to give a shout out to all of the chosen families out there. Amen. Not everyone has a loving family to share the holidays with, especially in the queer community. So I just want to say that you are still loved. Family isn't built on blood. It's built on loving and caring relationships. May you all enjoy your holidays with your families, however you may define it. Well said, Sean. Excellent. Well Excellent said. point. Look at this giant Malinois. <gasps> What a sweet baby. Oh, look at, and they have a before and after. So good. You can see the ribs, you know, like what the yeah. fuck? Wow, Sean, thank you for that. And um, good luck keeping up with the <laughs> vacuuming of the hair with three shepherds in the house. Next up from Suze, no pronouns. Hi, from Catherine in Northern Territory, Australia. Daily Beans has become my favorite podcast for catching up with American political news. I listen every morning on my way to work. Keep up the good fight. I'm sorry to hear about the fascism. I've enclosed the obligatory Aussie pictures of kangaroos in one of my paddocks, along with a picture of Henry the peacock, whose job it is to keep the pythons away from the chook where the pythons are washed out of their subterranean layers during the wet season. Finally, there's a picture of all my rescue cats being in a small town there's not much in the way of foster care for animals, so I've become a crazy cat lady by default. That's also how I ended up with my so many ginger cats. The great tabby is Ollie, who sometimes eye rolls so hard at the antics of the other ginger nuts that I have to unstuck his eyes for him. <laughs> <laughs> Suze, thank you for this. Hello, peacock. Oh, those kangaroos, and wow, look at all the kitty kitties. Yeah, yeah, dad. Okay, so I love Australia. I was just on Thursday morning in Australia of this week. I was on nice. today, um, today in Australia, which is their morning news show with, I believe, Sylvia and David had a blast talking about Trump being uh, thrown off the ballot in Colorado. They're so cool. They're so chill. Our news needs to be like Australian news. It really does. Right. Um, but thank you. Yeah. Sue's here is in Northern Territory. And I think the Today Show is filmed in Sydney. Uh, but, you know, and I think that's more to the South. But anyway, absolutely fantastic show. And if you saw me on there, if you're in Australia and you saw me on today, let me know. I want to hear from you uh, because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just curious as to, how, you know, how many folks, how many Beans listeners watch today. Totally. Where are you at down under? All right. This is from Purple Dot, pronounced she and her. Hello, Legume Anadis. Uh, I'm submitting some good news for your perusal. I started listening maybe a year ago after seeing AG all over Twitter, rest in peace, and have been a daily listener since. I'm a true independent living in central Alabama who's finding it harder and harder to get fact-based stories. Thank you both for your work. 
I'm trying to promote fact-based thinking down here, but unfortunately, most people age 50 and over just regurgitate Fox News talking points. The kids, though, they're all right. As the young are exposed to the entire world instead of only the few choices, it's been amazing to witness them thinking for themselves. I'm including two rescues. Feel free to guess the breeds. I'll share my guesses, too, for pot pet tax, including some origin stories so you have a better chance of guessing. Bacon Bits. Bacon Bits is the brown and white pup with floppy ears, and he was adopted from the Inner City Humane Society at 12 weeks old. Umbra is the black pup with pointy ears, and he came to me at nine months old instead of going to Rural Humane Society. He was born to a feral dog in the woods on a dairy farm. They were going to let him live as a stray pup there since he is so sweet, but he decided he wanted to take out the chickens. For size, they are both about 60 pounds. All right, Well, let's the see. one on the left, definitely some pity. Yeah, Urban. Okay, and Bacon Bits is one of the best names I've heard for a dog. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, I see pity and maybe lab. Um, and then, of course, this looks like a, a, like a roddy with the German shepherd. shepherd. It looks like one of those... You know, like it, like the cartoonized dog signs, like beware of dog. Ah, la, la. Like it looks like it looks like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the white stripe on bacon bits is amazing. So good. And the side eye is is pretty incredible. All right, let's see what we got here. Guesses. I think bacon bits is mostly pit bull with a grandparent that was a boxer. Oh, good good point. Looks like a boxer, and a grandparent that was a lab. Umbra is an enigma. He's too compact and not quite built right to have a lot of German Shepherd. He has such a narrow chest, I honestly think he's part coyote. One day I hope to genetically test them, and I'll be sure to update. Yes, please let us know what these doggos are. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to take this next short one and let you close out, only because I'm in so much pain. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, this one's from Dr. Jan, pronouns she and her. Here in Augusta, Georgia, we are fortunate to have two excellent bike trails alongside the Savannah River. My husband and I are riding on the South Carolina side Greenway when we were startled by this yellow in the road of this fellow in the road. See, I'm having a hard time. Comparison is hard without a reference, but she or he's about a foot and a half long, plus the long pointy tail. Scary. So what the hell is in this shell? Wow. A yeah, that looks like a dinosaur turtle. <laughs> It does. So does so does Stegosaurus? It's like a Tricera hardtop. Uh, I don't know this one. I don't know this one. Um, so I would love to know, Doctor Jan or Jan, if it's a soft J yogging. It's like a Stegosaurus and a turtle. It is. This is a dinosaur turtle, a foot and a half long. That's huge. All right. Maybe I'll look it up while you're reading the next good news, and we'll okay. have an answer. All right. Yeah. Google that. Long, j big turtle with dinosaur tail. <laughs> Fuck. That's the Google. That's the Google for that. All right. Last submission. Amy pronoun she and her. Not misheard lyrics, but misunderstood lyrics. And a warning for any parents who have kids listening. You might want to skip ahead and listen later. Nothing dirty, but you'll understand as you read on. Ah, ah, I see. This has to do with Santa. Okay. Oh. So kids listening. We have some secret Santa stuff to talk about, so you might want to mute this for any kids. All my life, I thought the song, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. Mommy was actually kissing Santa Claus. Then a couple years ago, seriously, like two years ago, and I'm in my mid-40s, my book club friends told me Santa Claus was dad in a costume. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Daddy is Santa Claus? I clearly remember that my older sister's sheet music for the piano had an old-fashioned image on the cover with Mommy giving Santa Claus a kiss on the cheek while Daddy is walking in from another room, carrying a tray of milk and cookies. You can't see Daddy's face or body. He's stepping into the room from a doorway, and all you see is his shoe and a pant leg, plus his hands holding the tray. This image is so vivid in my mind, I can clearly see his brown shoe and blue pant leg. I can see the fireplace, the couch, and the Christmas tree. I can see mommy wearing a 1950s dress with her high-heeled foot kicked up as she's kissing Santa's cheek. I texted my sister, begging her to dig through her old piano music to send me a photo to prove that I'm not losing my mind. Instead, what she sent me was a completely different image. Nothing like that. I remember. <laughs> My sister, by the way, has no recollection of what I've described. 
Plus, she always knew daddy was in the Santa suit. I have scoured the internet for the image. It looks remotely like what I recall. I found one, but all I find are images of different mommies kissing daddies wearing Santa costumes. I don't know if I've completely made something up that never existed or merged two or more images from my memory to create this one, or if I'm suffering from the Mandala effect. This has haunted me for the last two Christmases. If anyone out there listening can remember something similar or who has also thought mommy was innocently kissing the real Santa Claus, please speak up. Don't leave me in the land of confusion by myself for tax. I'm including a Christmas photo of my now 17-year-old daughter and now 12-year-old son when they were five and almost a year old, respectively. The two most adorable kids in the world. I'm so grateful I found the beans after I deleted my Twitter account when Jackass bought it. Twitter was my main source of news because I followed Muller She Wrote plus dozens of other trustworthy sources and journalists. I listen to the beans every morning while I walk my dog. I will share about my dog on another day. Plus clean up on aisle 45 and Jack with Andy McCabe swoon on the weekends. Yeah, and it's McBabe is what we call him. Keep up the good work and the good fight. These are anxious times that we're living in and I'm relieved that we have each other to cling to. Happy and restful holiday season. All right. Oh, so. your kids at this age are adorable. I bet they're even more beautiful now. I got and perfect hair. Look at that hair. Like, well, I, I know need... it's good. Hmm. And that little boy's smile. He's happy, happy baby. Oh, super happy, adorable kid. So, if you remember, I believe, did she say it was a piece of piano music? Uh, yeah, pian- sheet music for the piano with an old fashioned image of mommy kissing Santa Claus and daddy's foot and tray of cookies coming around the corner. If you know what that is, send it into us. We are in desperate need of releasing uh, Amy from her (laughs) anxiety. And to answer your question from the last submission, that what the hell is in that shell is an alligator snapping turtle. They look like little dinosaurs. That makes sense. They have three horns, like three ridges down their shell. Mm -hmm. They have a very prehistoric face, and they have that dinosaur-looking tail. Alligator snapping. Snapping dinosaurs. Snapping Snapping turtles. (laughs) I need to go to bed. The Allosaurus. Yeah, take Mm -hmm. some pain meds or more pain meds, depending on where you're at, and uh, get some rest this weekend, my friend. And over the next week, have a wonderful holiday season, everybody. I will be back next week with some amazing interviews from some incredible people. Uh, I hope you enjoy them. Uh, and of course, we'll have the regular episodes of Jack and Cleaned Up on L45. Um, do you have any final thoughts for the year? I think it just echoes a little bit of some of what we said today is that I know not everyone has a, a loving, happy, accepting family that they get along with. So I do hope that you've got a good family to spend the holidays with. And you know what? If you don't want to celebrate the holidays, don't celebrate the holidays. There's no requirements in this. And I know they're very hard for some people. Some people in our family and our Beans family have lost loved ones. Some this is some, This is hard. Sometimes holidays are hard for people. So I'm sending you all the love in the world. And I'm grateful for this community. I'm grateful for the last year with you, A.G., And I look forward to keeping democracy alive in 2024 because Lord knows we're going to need it. Yes. Thank you so much for that, my friend. I love you. I love everyone listening. Um, And, you know, again, your chosen family is your family. And please consider me part of your chosen family. And I send you all the holiday love. I don't know what I'm doing for New Year's. I I might just stay home with the cats. I might too. I have no idea. You know, but uh, I hope you feel better, my friend. I will see uh, the rest of you Sunday for Jack. Um, and uh, I appreciate uh, you listening this year to to all of this. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> um, gosh, till next year. Yeah. Please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your family, chosen or otherwise. Vote blue over Q. And take all of them with you. I've been H.E. And I've been D.G. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.